All right, welcome to episode seven of Joel's podcast show. I'm your host, Mark Maffini, and today with me I have a dear friend of mine, this awesome human being, big wave surfer, charger, gardener, and just much more, uh, Miss Paige Alms. How are you doing, Paige? Oh, super stoked to be here. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks for uh, making some time uh, to come uh, sit down with me. So um, there's a few things I'd like to get into, but uh, I was wondering, maybe we could just start from the beginning, um, you know, when you started surfing and just a little bit of background info. Yeah, I started surfing officially when I was, I had a surf lesson, I think it was nine, I, I think it was eight, but I say nine because it was on the border in Australia when I was traveling around Australia with my mom as a, um, as a kid for a year. And I had a surf lesson there. And when we moved to Maui shortly after that trip, it was something that I wanted to pursue because it was just so much fun. So my uh, aunt and uncle who have lived here on Maui for 40, 50 years almost, um, they had a board that was under one of their houses and was like, here, take this thing. And I basically taught myself how to surf. Like I had um, been on a bodyboard and felt really comfortable in the ocean as a kid so it was kind of just a natural progression to get off of the bodyboard and standing up on the bodyboard to getting on a surfboard and then yeah just doing the little circle at pavils out the channel catch a wave get pushed <laughs> in and it just progressed from there that's awesome did uh when did it become something that you thought uh like oh okay this is like kind of what i want to do for the rest of my life or, or when you started th- taking it a little bit more seriously i guess i think I knew right away that surfing was going to be a part of my life as soon as I started doing it because it was just so much fun. And I really enjoyed the challenge of getting better. And I just remember that feeling as a little kid where every day you made improvements and it was just so exciting. And, okay, I want to get better. I want to be able to make it all the way out. And, okay, I want to be able to turn here. And um, I knew that I was going to surf forever. When I... I think it was probably like when I was 12 or 13 was when I really realized like, okay, I want to be a professional surfer. This is what my dream is. And all of, you know, I was playing soccer a lot and I was playing baseball as a little kid and I was really good at soccer and that was kind of my focus. And I kind of pushed that aside and surfing took over. Nice. Um, I know you're fairly well known for booger surfing. I mean, you're a two-time world champ. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, but you're also a competitive surfer. I mean, you're on the Canadian team, right? I am, which was kind of a funny thing that just fell into my lap. It was, um, I mean, I did the QS in my early 20s and then kind of faded out of that. Just I didn't have a main sponsor at the time. It was really expensive to travel around the world chasing these waves. And the competitive stuff kind of, I don't know, I just lost interest and kind of focused more on surfing big waves. And then a couple of years ago, when um, talk of the Olympics came about, um, how did that even happen? I think my mom kind of was like, hey, you should try out for the Canadian team. And I reached out to the um, president of CSA, the Can- Canadian surf team, and talked to them. And they were like, yeah, come up and do nationals. You have to qualify to be on the team. And so I went up there and I made some really cool friends. I hadn't been back to Vancouver Island since I left when I was seven years old. Wow. So that was really cool um, to see that as an adult and just through, you know, completely different eyes and qualified. I want to say that was 2018 for the team Mm -hmm. and then competed in Japan and Peru with them in 2019. And then... I, since the Olympics got pushed, pushed back a year, um, the last qualifier was in El Salvador and that was this summer. And I went there and I was two or three heat shy of qualifying, which okay. was pretty cool. Cause it was something that like I hadn't competed in shortboard events in years, you know, I'd done mm-hmm. an event here and there at Honolulu, but it was a really cool opportunity to kind of sink my feet in and kind of like rewind and relearn how to surf competitively like I'm so prone to just sitting out the back and waiting for the best wave to come and as you know in contests you can't do that (laughs) (laughs) that was like my biggest issue uh surf competitions too is that I'd either like sit out the back or just like paddle battle guys too deep and then we'd all just be too deep for waves yeah 
Um, <laughs> Cody's on the Canadian team as well. Yes. Right? How's that? Like both, uh, you guys both know each other from here. I mean, we tr- used to train at the same gym together, and then all of a sudden you guys are on the same team. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it was super cool. It was definitely a um, not a driving force, but like a it was really exciting to have someone that I knew really well on the team as well. Mm-hmm. And I became really good friends with Matea Olin, who's um, one of the youngest women on the team and she's like a little sister that i didn't have and i feel like we're super bonded like we became friends right away i was like oh this is this kid's cool um but having cody there it's like someone that i see every day so it was really rad to be on a team and doing something you know it's a team sport essentially like everyone is down at everyone's heats and you're like when you lose you you don't just feel like you lost, you lost for your team. So it's kind of a heavy experience. So it was really cool to, to be there with him and just to watch him surfing ahead of the event was insane. Like I truly believed that he was going to qualify out of our whole team. He was surfing the best and he was on fire every session. And just didn't he almost, he got like called up to go, right? Yeah, and he was he like actually, on his way there. And he then... had a crazy experience. He lost out in El Salvador pretty easy or not easy early. Sorry. <laughs> um, which caught everyone by surprise. Like I truly thought that he was going to be the one to qualify and just had a really hard shitty heat and, and didn't make it. And then I guess he got the call. I've still haven't talked to him in person. We just texted yeah. about it. I was like, did you really go to Japan? And he got the call up from um the isa games the year before so it's a weird tiered process from all these different contests on how to qualify and he got the call up to go and got on a plane and i guess like flew there and didn't get there in time and i don't really know exactly what happened yeah. but it was kind of a crazy experience like i think he had like a couple hours to be at the airport holy shit i gotta ask him <laughs> about that yeah um so how did you start surfing Jaws? And was it something that like you always kind of wanted to do? Or is it something that evolved as you progressed throughout surfing? Hmm. Well, I started like paddling big wave surfing when I was 15, the Outer Reefs. And I knew that I really enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. And I'd always felt really confident and comfortable in bigger surf compared to a lot of like my, you know, competitive girls that I was competing with, never really liked that. And I always really loved it. I was like, cool, this is a, another challenge. And, um, to really put your like ocean knowledge to the test on like an extreme level, you know? Mm -hmm. So as I got older and I started toe surfing out there a little bit and just was having fun. And then, um, you know, as the crew started paddling out there and a lot of my friends were doing it, you know, I was watching Albie and Marlon and Matt and I was like, hey, like, they're doing that? I want to do that. (laughs) I don't want to be left out. And so I had Sean make me some boards and I remember the first time I picked up my 10-2, I was like, oh God, I don't know if I want to ride a board that big. (laughs) It's just crazy. Yeah. yeah. Um, When was the first time you paddled out there? Um, that was, I'm so bad with dates. Dude, me too. I was, uh, Albie was in here earlier talking and he somehow can still remember the dates of like specific swells. It's like, oh yeah, that was like 2017, 2016. To me, it's like all a blur. Yeah. I'm like, I think that, I think it was 10 years ago. Was it 2011? I'd have to look. <laughs> yeah. Maybe 11 years ago. Yeah. Something like that. 2010, mm-hmm. 2011. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing that is kind of specific to you um, is that how how does it feel? Because big wave surfing in general and then Jaws as well is seems to be uh, somewhat male dominated. Um, not, you know, there's just mo- more guys out there than there are girls. And there are some up and coming females right now like uh, Skylar Lickle and Annie and m- probably a few more as well. Mm-hmm. Um that are starting to charge, but how does it feel, you know, being in that environment and, uh, you know, charging with the guys and charging harder than most of the, a lot of the guys out there? Yeah. I mean, it, for me, like looking back on it, it was, it was never like the beginning of paddling out there. It was never like, Oh, 
I'm the only girl out here, it was like, okay, it just felt normal because mm-hmm. a lot of our surf sessions here, I mean, especially when I was growing up, I was one of the only girls in the lineup at six foot Hokipa mm-hmm. and one of a couple at Honolulu. And so it was kind of just like, an, it felt normal. Um, and then, you know, after the first year of paddling out there, like Andrea, I think was going to paramedic or EMT school that year. So she wasn't around that year. And so I, I was kind of out there alone as the only girl. And then Kaola came over the following seasons every time there was a swell. And it was really rad because she would come and stay with me. And we were like this, you know, we were team green. We were both on green boards. And it was just really fun to have another girlfriend out there to share that with. You know, the guys are like, it's just a different experience. Like the boys all hang out together. They're not like calling me like, you want to come over and chat the night before, you know, like they don't do that. So it was, it's really fun to have more women getting into the sport. And, you know, when, um, when Bianca comes over and Andrea's off of work and we're all out there, like, it's a really rad feeling to look around at like people that you really like enjoy surfing with um, that are other women out there when there's 70 guys out and there's only three or four girls like it's a pretty cool bond you know yeah it's badass it's rad and now with so many um, up and coming girls and and guys like there's such young such a younger generation now that are coming up and it's just so awesome to see you know Skylar Annie Izzy like these girls just have so much under their belt at such a young age and it's just so exciting like I I was doing that but a few years later so to just see you know they're 10 12 years younger than me and just looking at that like wow like you have so much to do in the next you know yeah till they're my age I'm like you're gonna do so much it's just so exciting to see the the beginning of it all yeah absolutely um and I mean, obviously, I can't speak for them, but I feel like, you know, being able to see people like you and, you know, have representation is probably inspiring other, you know, girls that, like, may be younger and are maybe just starting out to surf and might actually be thinking about, oh, like, you know, why not? Why can't I, like, start surfing big waves, you know? Totally. Which is awesome. You can't. I feel like that was something that was kind of missing when I was growing up. Like, Kaola was the only girl that I really knew of that was charging. You know, there were a lot of um, the older generation that were surfing big waves and charging Waimea. And I just didn't have, like, a personal relationship with any of those people. So Kaola, like, she, her and Rochelle Ballard were, like, the two charging on tour, getting barreled, like, surfing waves that I really wanted to surf. So they were the two main girls that I looked up to. Cause I was like, okay, I want to be able to do that. I want to get barreled in Tahiti. Like, <laughs> this is sick. Whoa. Did you see that? And as Kala kind of faded out of, um, the competitive career and kind of aimed her focus on big wave surfing, she essentially was the only one to be getting paid at the time to do that. And mm-hmm. then others followed after that, but I didn't necessarily have like a, a pathway to follow you know there were no female big wave surfers doing it as a job it was more of a passion and I feel like now since there are still such a small you know number of us but there are more for sure the next generation is looking up to what we're doing now and is like oh I could do that I could pursue that that's something that I want to do and I think if you have the ability to see that and visualize that then you know more and more girls are going to get into it and for sure, there are, because there's so many young girls that are just charging already. Yeah. We're going to have a 12-year-old out there this year, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I said they keep getting younger and younger. Like, I thought we were young, and then I said they just keep getting, like, beating us by, like, a year or two and three, and now yeah. they're just going to be, like, groms. F- 15, 16, it's like, no, you got to be 11 or straight 12. Straight up. <laughs> Dude, straight up. I remember when I was a grom, and I remember hearing about, um, I think it was the twins, or it was it Walsh, you like, oh, they're like, surf they towed it when they were 16 or something like okay fuck it i want to be out there when i'm 15 and now there's groms that are like 13 Chaz was actually 13 when he first started towing it yeah anyways um so how many times have you won like won the jaws comp now three three times and it's ran has they have have they had a women's division in it all years for four years four out of the five okay yeah 
And then the, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but the pay now is equal. Yeah. Right. Okay. It is. That's pretty cool. Yeah. That was a. Hopefully that inspires more girls to want to do it too. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and then you're in a pretty uh, good situation with, uh, you know, having Sean on your side with like shaping boards and stuff. I mean, you're always able to kind of try out new boards and you know how's that uh dynamic yeah so for those that are listening that don't know sean's my fiance and has been my board shaper for almost 15 years next month which is crazy (laughs) um and for sure that has been such a huge part of my career is having that connection with him because I feel like if the closer you are with your shaper, the further you can push things and you don't have to hold back and trying to, you know, you're not going to hurt someone's feelings saying, I don't like this because of this. And I mean, sometimes we go out to dinner and it's like all we're talking about and I'm like, (laughs) okay, like let's cut it off, you know, and leave it there. Um, But as far as like big wave surfing goes, it's huge because it's um, being able to like tweak things just so subtly for your body and what you want to feel. And Sean's really good at interpreting what I'm feeling under my feet. Sometimes, like, I know a lot about surfboards now through hanging out with him and spending so much time, you know, in the factory and stuff. But I can I can tell him what I'm feeling and what I want to be able to do, and he can interpret that and tweak things and pull that rail in more. And, okay, let's make it slightly wider here. And, and just those little you know, changes are huge, especially on a giant wave and feeling confident and comfortable with what's under your feet. So yeah, super, super grateful. And it's really fun too, because we get to be creative and test things out together. And he's always there for every session that I've ever had out at Jaws, I think, for, except for maybe one. Um, the year that I didn't win the contest, he wasn't there. <laughs> <Fucking Sean. laughs> but yeah, that's really special too, because he actually gets to see it firsthand, like what the boards are doing. And um, yeah, I feel very lucky. Nice. Um, do you have any specific training regiments and stuff uh, catering to Jaws, or is it more just, uh, you know, fitness for fitness itself? Yeah, I mean, mostly it's fitness and overall and feeling good and feeling strong and fit going into winter it's not necessarily like strictly focused on you know crazy breath holds and getting absolutely tomahawked and beat up like we're you know i'm 33 now and i feel like wipeouts out there hurt a lot more than they did 10 years ago Mm -hmm. and so i'm really trying to just like feel really good and strong and fit and avoid injuries. (laughs) So, um, we actually just started our winter camp. I usually do like a six week prep camp, just kind of brutal by the way. Yeah. (laughs) We're on week two, um, running Haleakala tomorrow. (laughs) How tall is Haleakala? I should know this by the way. 10,000 feet. Yeah. 10,000 feet running. That sucks. There's like no oxygen. (laughs) It's horrible. (laughs) But I mean, at the end of, um, you know, that camp, you feel the best yeah. ever. So going into winter when you're feeling really fit and really strong and everything's kind of tuned in, it's like, I feel like I'm a lot more focused and can kind of relax and just focus on the waves coming. And when a, a storm pops up, I get excited rather than like, oh, I haven't done all the work. And um, luckily I've been home for a really long time. Normally I'm coming home this time of the year from traveling all mm-hmm. summer long and probably having a bit too much fun and out of shape and right now I feel like I'm ready to go if a swell came next week so yeah going into camp it's it's pretty awesome when you're feeling really good already <laughs> that's definitely a plus just for like the mental aspect as well 100 percent. I mean when I'm feeling really fit like I'm feeling super confident and I know that I can go out and just focus on riding waves rather than you know the what ifs and the worries and yeah, I like feeling good. <laughs> yeah. Um, besides Jaws, are there any other big waves that you've uh, gone to and had fun at? Or liked? Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, I've surfed Mavs, Totos, been down to um, Porto and Pasquales and 
You were on the trip with me when I broke my shoulder. Oh, shit, that's <laughs> right. Day, was that day one, wave day one? Day one, uh, wave five or something, yeah. Dude, tell, tell the kid, did you explain that story? Oh, that was just horrible. Um, yeah, that trip popped up and jumped on with all the boys and was super excited. And, you know, doing step-offs into crazy... 10 foot barrels it yeah. was pretty sick <laughs> dude it was sick and it's such a dream wave you get barreled every single time and yeah i got a, f- a few really fun waves and was just starting to get more comfortable and i was on the wrong board and now i have really sick step off boards that are designed specifically for that wave and when i went back with the proper board it's so much easier <laughs> um but not um blaming it on on my board because it was more the conditions had just changed and the wind had slightly started to crumble on shore and as I bottom turned on a wave that I probably would have been standing in if it was still offshore and just got hit yeah. like a I can't even explain it I I mean there and jaws are the only places I've ever been hit that hard and direct impact and my shoulder popped out of place and yeah, fractured my shoulder, was out of the water for five and a half months and had surgery a couple of years later and it was a long Recovery. process. Yeah. How's the shoulder now? Really good. Yeah. Super strong. I don't really ever think about it except that it doesn't go in backwards position, but I never think about it anymore, which is a nice feeling. It took like five years though. <laughs> Damn, that's a long recovery process. Yeah. Like I felt good, but it was more the mental aspect of recovering from that because it was actually like a really severe trauma, I think. Did that affect the way, like kind of your aspect on, you know, surfing jaws and stuff? Yeah, I think so. I think just like life in general, because I'd never had like a really severe injury like that that kept mm-hmm. me out of the water that long. And that kind of, like, rattled my soul, you know? Like, it sucks being hurt. Um, But I also, like, really got into my fitness more. Like, I was training a lot then, but I feel like I know my body so much more and so much better. And I know when things aren't right, where before I was kind of just winging it and would kind of go on anything and wasn't really scared. I mean, of course I was scared, but it was more of a you know, let's just hail Mary and go for it. And now I'm way more methodical and especially with age. And it's like, I just get so beat up when I get pounded out there. I don't (laughs) like it. Like, you know, getting caught by a huge wave, like it's not how it was when I was, you know, 21. So I, I've become a lot more methodical on the waves that I choose and, um, the waves that I want to ride and just go out there to the good ones yeah i think that's smart i think uh when we started first paddling i think everyone was a little bit of a just gung-ho like whip it and just go and then figure it out later (laughs) i remember like everyone would just like yell each other to go on waves that just had no one had any right to go they're like straight closeouts and they still just go (laughs) send it get to the bottom (laughs) (laughs) just get to the bottom and figure it out after um are you working on any new projects or anything for this winter or um, I'm actually in the process of kind of figuring that out. I have a, a few little projects here and there with sponsors. And then, um, I'm hoping that we're going to start filming a very exciting project that I'm actually allowed to talk about now, which is pretty cool. Um, I was a part of a New York times article with Andrea, Keala and Bianca three years ago now. I think I remember that article. Yeah, and that article recent, actually not recently, last year got purchased by Charlize Theron's production company, Denver and Delilah. Um, they bought the Our Life Rights and Story um, are based around that article. And the article is basically how we helped um, attain pay parity in women surfing, in surfing in general. And so this movie project um, just recently got bought by Netflix. And so... Wow, congrats. Yeah, we're super stoked. Um, It's a Hollywood film, so I'm hoping we're all doing our own stunts for it. But Mm -hmm. 
obviously people will be playing us, but it'll be a fun project to be a part of. And I'm really hoping they'll want to start filming ASAP because we all know how big waves are. Yeah. We might not get any. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, sometimes they, they start in October and then sometimes they'll just wait until like January to like start firing off. Yeah. So fingers crossed. And yeah, just a few projects here and there um, over the winter. Things usually start to pop up soon as waves do yeah are you still doing the uh trashy selfie project? trashy selfie project yeah it's been a little bit um it's been put on hold a little bit just with everything going on and it's it's still there but it hasn't been a main focus this summer we've been building a house so everything's kind of been pushed aside that's been our main focus and any free time that i have i'm down there planting stuff or painting beams or I mean, today we were pouring concrete, so... <laughs> yeah. What was the uh, genesis of Trashy Self Project? It was a pretty cool... Or it is a pretty cool idea. Yeah. It started off with basically a conversation that my friend Sarah Hauser, who's a professional windsurfer, and I... Um, we were just talking about, you know, using our platforms on social media. You know, as athletes, we have um, a pretty unique platform to be able to share things. And we were just talking about some creating something together that we could use our athletic platforms to share something with the world that could help the world. And honest, you know, like we can't all be doing 100% of um, cleaning the beaches and, mm -hmm. you know, just it's more based around little things, little changes can make huge impact if everybody's doing them. And so it just started off with a conversation of like, okay, let's, what can we do and how can we give back? And it basically turned into a social media campaign of um, encouraging people to pick up trash when they see it. Don't just walk by it. So <laughs> Yeah, that's a it, huge thing, I feel like. Yeah, it's like you see a, a piece of trash on the beach, pick it up, take a selfie, tag us in it, and... Um, it basically we got our sponsors involved and you could win some sunscreen or whatever it may be and it it was really fun and it's pretty cool to see kids jump on it you know it was something that we were like okay we could get kids really excited about this you know mm -hmm. it's trashy selfie take some selfies <laughs> <laughs> um and yeah it's been really cool we've um traveled with the idea and the project to a couple different places around the world and got people pretty psyched on it nice yeah um, and then I seen that you've been uh, really into gardening lately. Is that uh, due to the pandemic, or is that something that like you always kind of wanted to have like a home with your own garden? And yeah, I mean, I grew up with my mom having the most amazing, beautiful garden ever that I can remember. So I grew up around that, and you know, I've always had a little raised bed garden wherever. Sean and I have lived and it's something that I've always really loved growing my own food and for sure on like a smaller scale just you know kale and herbs and tomatoes and stuff that um, we use on a day-to-day -day basis and then over the past few years it's something that I've like become let me stop no no it's okay you can continue that camera just died but I'm gonna just whip this one around okay I'm not going to edit any of this. This is all going to be in it. All right. <laughs> all right. Um, yeah, it's just something that I've become extremely passionate about. And it's something that I think living on an island, living anywhere in general, but living here on an island and really like kind of diving into what if the food stops coming here. Mm -hmm. And for sure, I think that was a really big eye opener for a lot of people, um, during the pandemic last year and hence why they were out of compost and garden soil and everything here. And yeah, I just think it's really important. I think it's the biggest and easiest way that we can like individually impact the climate. I think we can impact our um, consumption and our you can use way less plastic waste. You're not going to the store. You're not driving as much, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And you're also growing stuff that is way better. Does it's, it taste better? It tastes better. It's um, something that's really fun to be able to share with people. It's something that, like, I absolutely love. I can't. I've been trying to get better at putting it into words because there's nothing better than growing your own food 
processing that, chopping it up, whatever, and creating a meal and sharing that with people in your community, like there is a huge, amazing connection with your community when you can do that and share and thrive. And that's how things used to be. Yeah. And I feel like we've gotten so disconnected, like our phones and being on, you know, being so connected that we're disconnected. And I just absolutely love it. So this property that we have, we're creating, we have a 1.4 acre lot and we're literally making a food forest. Like we've planted some privacy stuff, but the majority of it is all going to be something that you can eat or use. Um, and I'm just making a little permaculture regenerative farm and it's pretty rad and basically starting from the basics. So we're trying everything we can to mend the soils and, you know, learning from the ground up and, I mean, I have an amazing garden there already, but just learning more about trees and what to plant where and why. And Dude, that's an awesome idea. Just to like, instead of, you know, having a lawn. Totally. Like you just, you have, you grow food. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Like the actual like data on if we all kind of, you know, I think it's if we got rid of 40% of our lawns or something, um, we could completely reverse like the, the situation that yeah. we are in. <laughs> and it's... It's pretty rad, you know, when you're harvesting your own bananas that you planted, you know, a year and a half ago, and you get to share that with your neighbors, and your neighbors give you eggs, and, you know. Trade you... fish with Laurent. And... Yeah, trade fish, and I just recently got into hunting, and now I'm absolutely obsessed with that, because now we're really, like, farm and garden to no table. No way. What type of hunting? <laughs> uh, bow hunting. Dude, I've been wanting to get into that, too, but now that I moved to Oahu, it's kind of a little bit harder but who's when uh you're back. <laughs> yeah how's uh how's that been it's been insane it's just like a complete package you know being able to supply your own I mean I enjoy eating meat and I really enjoy eating food where you know where it comes from like like you said trading someone you know a bundle of greens for a slab of fish like that's the coolest thing ever and now it's coming full circle because I shot my first buck no two weeks way ago. how was that How's that feeling? It was a pretty insane feeling. And the first day that I went hunting um, with Sierra and her dad, Sean, it was absolutely like instantly like, oh, I'm going to do this forever. (laughs) It reminds me so much of big wave surfing because you have to be 100% there. You're not wondering, you know, who's checking your phone. There's no time for that. You have to be smelling, looking, listening tuned in there's not a lot of talking the only time that you're really talking is if you see deer and you're coming up with a strategy or where we're gonna hike or and you're just completely tuned in turned off from all the chaos around you and you're just out in nature and it reminds me a lot of being out in a big wave lineup um minus all the people of course (laughs) um but just being completely tuned in the way the waves are moving where's the wind coming from what's the tide doing you know, all of those things. And it's so much like that and being completely present in the moment, but you get to do it for, you know, an hour, like an afternoon session. We're out there for three and a half hours and I'm not thinking about anything else. And my mind goes like a million miles an hour and I tend to overload my schedule with way too much going on. And that has been something that I've been scheduling in. It's almost like a therapy (laughs) session and you get to just tap into nature and be out there and then actually like catching something and going through the whole process of you know breaking down this animal and thanking it for for feeding a lot of people and being able to share um that meat with other people I think is a it's the best way if you're gonna actually like eat meat that Mm -hmm. is the best way to do it and I'm completely obsessed and I just think it's a really magical full circle experience, very similar to having a garden, but um, with that extreme high and adrenaline rush also. Dude, I imagine it was difficult to like get up close. I, was it an access deer? Yeah. And what, you just like stalked it, got up to it? Yeah, it was, um, yeah, it's kind of a crazy process. Every time you go, it's completely different than the last. And, you know, we've had some stalks from like, a thousand yards away you see a huge herd up on the hill and you try to get up there and you're you know there's and then there's ones where you're like walking up the hill and you're like oh my god this thing doesn't even see us it's right there (laughs) 
Um, but that one in particular was funny because we found this herd, got up to it, then they disappeared. They got spooked or saw us or a pig scared them or whatever. So we were leaving and going back to another zone and we hit this spot and I was like, I looked at Sierra and I just was like, oh my God, there's a huge buck right there. <laughs> and it had a pig following it. It was oh, the weirdest shit. thing. And I literally had like 10 seconds of just like, okay, things not moving. And I drew an arrow and she sighted it in for me. And it was like a team effort and got it. And that was my first one. And it was so cool, like processing it all. And it made me really appreciate every single time I've been given a bag of ground venison Mm -hmm. or a steak. Yeah. Um, And yeah, shared it with a lot of friends and it's super cool. (laughs) Dude, that sounds so sick. I want to, I want, I need to do that. Um, all right. Well, we only have a few more minutes left before you got to go to, uh, uh, Sam's to go train. Yeah. But, uh, I asked some people for some questions and we got a good one. So Malia, chimed in she's like ask Paige why she's a hoe from ho island (laughs) (laughs) wow (laughs) no but uh uh we got a good one from kelly and she was like what are some techniques uh she uses to overcome any fears of surfing big waves do you have any techniques or how do you how do you cope with the that stress yeah, I guess it's, I think it's gotten a lot better over the years, like the first few years, you know, the anticipation of a swell coming. And now I just like try to just stay present. And when a swell pops up, you know, you're getting texts and everybody's talking about the swell that's coming. And I try not to get too excited about it. Dude, that's like the worst part is the like the, the day build before. Up. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like everybody's phones are blowing up and what's it going to be like? And then, you know, it's, and it's different every time, but. I think just trying to, like, focus on, you know, what's important to you is really, like, a good way of getting over the fear. Because if you're out there chasing big waves and trying to ride these waves for the wrong reasons, I feel like fear, you know, kind of is a huge part of it. And I think listening to yourself and being afraid is a good thing. You know, it's really important to tap into that. And, like, those emotions are there for a reason. But... You know, I think, like I said earlier, just going out with the intention of picking, you know, specific waves. I'm not just going out there to Hail Mary and I don't need to catch a hundred waves. I'm going out there to ride a few that day. And, you know, just it's different every single time that we're going out there. Some days it's windy and it's a lot more terrifying. Some days it's like friendly and glassy and it's just finding the right one. It's just so different all the time, but I really try to just push fear aside, you know, listen to it, ask myself really like why and what I'm afraid of, and then learn how to push through that. Because that feeling of like pushing beyond a boundary that you've set for yourself is like a really, really like empowering feeling. And I just think it's like from that, like pushing past that is something that, you know, it fuels the fire. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think... You know, big waves are scary, and don't get me wrong, I'm scared every single time I'm out at Jaws, but learning how to push that aside and just focus on what you're out there to do, and I'm usually out there to find the good ones and not fall. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that, Paige, thank you so much uh, for coming on. I can't wait to hear about the the Netflix show and uh, to see your garden in, in a, a few years. Yeah. Um, do you have any parting words of wisdom for the f- future generation? I think don't forget to ride your step ups before going to a <laughs> tent. <laughs> That's my biggest um, tip for all these groms that are growing up that just want to, you know, they want to go from Hokipa to Jaws. And I'm like, okay, ride a step up, ride bigger boards, go to the outer reefs, and, you know, don't skip the in between because there's so many life lessons that you can learn on riding a 7 0 and riding an 8 0 and, um, you know, getting pounded and and getting pushed in by a 20 wave set and yeah. then, you know, just baby steps. There's no rush in big wave surfing cuz it's a it's a lifelong journey. It's not something that's just like one or two years. Yeah, I would agree. Um when Tyler and all of us were younger, we would go out to Hokipo when it was closing out and then we started going to uh the outer reefs 
and then Jaws, but it was a gradual, yeah. you know, in, uh, inclination. So I, I agree on that one. So Paige, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. You're a very busy woman. We had we tried to do this for the last like a few days. Yeah, I'm sorry, <laughs> no. but we made it happen. <laughs> yeah. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, good luck training with Sam. Thanks. <laughs>